All right, so I'm here with Fletch Newland of Boardman Bikes. Uh, Kona is a great place to unveil new products. It's the mecca for triathlon, and Boardman has done absolutely that this year. They've got a really, really cool new bike. Uh, if you're not familiar with Chris Boardman, he's uh, three is his number, as you were saying, Fletch. Uh, he's worn the yellow jersey three times. He's won uh, three prologues, and he's the three-time hour-long or oh, our TT record. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, this bike, Fletch? Sure. This bike is uh, three years in the making. As soon as one comes out, they're immediately frustrated. They couldn't get more of the stuff that they thought of out and just start right on the next one. So this has been three years of, uh, of working development. I gotta say, we're pretty pleased with it. Um, well, where do you want to start? Well, I, I know that uh, part of the, the um, I don't want to say complaint, but part of the issue with the previous uh, ATT is uh, it seems like the industry has gone a little bit taller uh, on the frontal area and shorter on the top tube. And, and I think you guys have done a little bit of that with this bike. We have. The bikes have been known as being a bit uh, long and low. Um, some folks like to use the term aggressive. When you have three of the greatest triathletes that are alive today, and the Brownlee brothers racing ITU, winning pretty much everything that there is to win, Pete Jacobs as the uh, reigning king of Kona, and of course coming from Chris Boardman, who's you know one of the greatest uh, guys against the clock there's ever been, there's kind of that mindset of you make it for the very, very fastest. We've done a reasonable job of that. But as we're expanding and becoming uh, you know, more a brand that the rest of the world is wanting to have and you know, growing a bit, it's time to, to uh, not lose that same focus, but make it maybe a slight bit more accessible. So we've raised the head tubes a little bit to do just that. You know, the, the, uh, this rear area looks very clean. Uh, I think in this particular bike you've covered uh, with uh, tape where you adjust the saddle, but this whole area seems very, very clean. Uh, obviously the integrated brake. Um, and um, you know, tell us a little bit more about how the front end and uh, sure. the cockpit works as well. Yeah, there's a couple of things here that are, that are kind of cool. As you were mentioning, Andres, a couple things also that are rapid prototypes still. We got this thing off the plane Wednesday morning at the crack of dawn. We unveil it to the world at noon, and we're finishing final screws and touches at, um, you know, right before we went on stage. So there's a couple things, like the cover that you mentioned right here. Uh, there'll be a, a cover, I'm not even sure what it is yet, because it's so new I haven't seen it, but uh, it won't be tape over the top. What we have here is a collar, seat collar, just like what you find in a typical road bike. It clamps like this, only inside, underneath the carbon. So there's no pinch bolts, there's, no, there's nothing to slide. When you set it, it's done and uh, it stays right there. Up front, as you were suggesting, uh, if you look at our you know, previous bike, just like most everybody's bikes, uh, of, especially you know, previous generations, cables everywhere. What we've managed to do is hide the cables to the point there's darn near nothing to be seen. And in fact, the, kind of the brains of it all is underneath this cover. So what you see initially is your uh, DI2 controller, but you also notice that the, the front brake uh, lead goes right straight down through the steer. And that was a big deal to try to figure out. So, in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, in fact, you could change if you wanted to. Chris would not be happy, but you could change the fork out with almost anything else you'd want. You could change the, uh, the whole bar assembly out with anything else you want. It's all interchangeable. This is one of those prototype pieces where you can see it doesn't sit quite as it should. It will in the final version. And then down in the brakes, behind the covers, on both sides, you have full access to all of your adjustment. But because everything is completely hidden, you don't get knocked around. It doesn't get bumped and moved and needing a great deal of adjustment. So uh, we're, we're, we're liking that quite a bit. And it's a nice improvement over what we've done prior. How adjustable is going to be this uh, front end? Excellent question. When you have the superbike things, adjustability is, is everything. It's not any good when it fits three people and the rest of the world's like, I really wish I could ride that but can't. So what we're going to have here is 10 centimeters of vertical adjustment. So we can bring your armrest way, way, way up. Uh, basically, uh, almost like just a huge bunch of stackers, only where stackers are round and terrible aerodynamically, these will all be arrow and work nicely. And 
then from there, the pads move in and out, and then they swap as well, so you've got a full range of adjustability from the guys who might be doing an Olympic distance or a TT, who stay really in tight with their elbows, to guys more, air, uh, more Ironman who there's no way they're going to be out there for five hours pinched in like this. They need to open up their chest and breathe a bit. This will move with them. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, finally, just um, what everybody wants to know is uh, what are we looking at in terms of uh, uh, cost, uh, retail price for, for this uh, You want to know about machine. cost, you want to know about how much better it is. <laughs> well, it, that too. I mean, it certainly, uh, you guys were saying at the, uh, at the press conference that it's about 20, you feel yeah. about 20% better? Faster? <laughs> We, we did, when we did the press conference, it was fairly abbreviated. So let me give you the, the, the full picture just briefly, if I may. When you look at this frame versus that frame, our previous generation, yes, it is basically the, all the different yaw angles. If you kind of boil it down to an average, it's about 20% faster than what we had before. And that sounds wonderful, and most manufacturers would leave it at that. But if you start to think about it, if these manufacturers were all correct and they threw huge numbers like this, as Chris says, we'd be fast approaching the speed of light. I don't know about you, but I'm not. So you have to look at things a little bit more deeply. And so then when you put all the gear on it and a rider on the bike, that 20% drops to 11% immediately. And on top of that, when you understand that 80% of the aerodynamic drag is in your body, with 20% of the bike, you put that equation to it, your real world difference is 3.3%. That's the practical, pragmatic, real world difference. So then when you put that over the course of 112 miles of an Ironman, and try to come up with as close to an average as you can, which is an impossibility because the winds are going to be you know, varying and the undulations of the road, etc. But over kind of the closest average we can come up with, it's about a seven minute savings over our previous generation. Wow. And, and that's, I mean, that's huge. The, the, the Brits, uh, I mean, Chris Boardman has been involved with uh, UK uh, Institute of Sport, I, I think is, is what it's called. And they're all about marginal gains. And when you talk about a seven minute advantage over an Ironman, I mean, that's, I think that's approaching even beyond marginal beyond gains. goes beyond marginal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, agreed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Chris was, uh, for nine years, the head of R&D for British Cycling. They got lottery money from the government, and the sole purpose was to figure out how to make the cyclists a force. And whatever it took, his reputation, they just let him do his thing. And he figures he spent between four and five days a month for nine years in the winter. I'm not sure there's anybody alive who can lay claim to anything even all that close to that. And they had zero commercial pressure to come up with a product that they could sell that would then recoup those costs. So they just learned and learned and learned. And these British cyclists themselves, the pros, all have in their contract when they're racing for their country, they can race whatever bike they want. And so if you look back to the 2012 Olympics, some of the big name guys like Cavendish and Wiggins, they weren't riding their team bikes. They weren't riding a Boardman, it's important to understand that, but they were riding the British cycling bikes that Chris Boardman was on. And if you look at them back and forth, you might notice some similarities. Yeah. yeah, no, and uh, I, you know, when you, you can't go wrong with Chris Boardman, uh, he's got a tremendous pedigree. And, uh, you know, I, I, we're real excited about this bike to see how it does. And just to uh, put you on the spot once again, what, what, are, you, what are we looking in terms of uh, retail for this beauty? I, I only ducked you the first time, and I can't really duck you the second time because, in fact, I don't know. Okay. Uh, we just had this come out. Uh, we're fortunate. I mean, as a British company, they want to do all the unveiling of all the new line there. And because this is, as you said, kind of the mecca for all of this, we were able to do it here pre before everything else. So our, our complete Elite Series launch will be in England uh, November 7th. And at that point, we'll have all the pricing out. I honestly don't know what it is right now. So that's less than a month away. We'll obviously keep uh, an eye on for that. And uh, we really appreciate your time. We thank you for uh, showing us the bike and for taking a few minutes. And uh, we'll look out for Pete Jacobs tomorrow. Hold it up real quick. Let's see. And then you've got, you know, Madagascar.